An interview with Ed Sakota. Everybody gets what they want. Although completely unknown, not only to the public, but to most of the financial community as well, Ed Zakota's achievements must certainly rank him as one of the best traders of our time. In the early 1970s, Zakota was hired by a major brokerage firm. He conceived and developed the first commercial computerized trading system for managing clients' money in the futures markets. His system proved quite profitable. But interference and second guessing by management significantly impeded its performance. This experience provided the catalyst for Sakota going out on his own. In the ensuing years, Sakota applied his systemized approach to trading a handful of accounts and his own money. During that period, the accounts Sakota managed have witnessed an absolutely astounding rate of return. For example. As of mid 1988, one of his customer accounts, which started with five thousand dollars in 1972, was up over two hundred fifty thousand percent on a cash on cash basis. Normalized for withdrawals, the account theoretically was up several million percent. I know of no other trader who has matched this track record over the same length of time. I never heard of Sakota when I first began working on this book. Sakota's name had come up several times during my interview of Michael Marcus as the person who was most influential in transforming him into a successful trader. After our interview, Marcus said reflectively, "You know, you really should interview Ed Sakota. He's not only a great trader; he's a great mind." Marcus provided an introduction over the phone, and I briefly outlined the concept of my book to Sakota. Since I was already out west, it was most convenient for me to interview Sakota on the same trip by rerouting my return to New York via Reno. Sakota was agreeable to participating, but seemed skeptical of my ability to complete the interview in the space of two hours, the time available in order for me to make my flight connections. I assured him that although it was tight, I had done a few other interviews in that space of time. It's feasible as long as our conversation remains very focused. I explained. I cut my arrival at the airport extremely close, having forgotten to revise my ticket to reflect the change in itinerary. After a vociferous argument with a ticket agent who insisted I didn't have enough time to catch my flight, a contention she nearly made self-fulfilling, I raced through the airport, reaching the gate with only seconds to spare. By the time I arrived in Reno, the tension from my near-missed flight had just about dissipated. The drive to Sakota's house was too far for a cab, so I rented a car. It was very early morning, and the highway winding up into the mountains offered spectacular vistas below. The classical music station I found on the radio was playing Mozart's clarinet concerto. The combination was glorious. Sakota works from an office in his house, which borders Lake Tahoe. Before beginning the interview, we took a brief walk out onto the beach behind his house. It was a cold, clear morning, and the view was idyllic. The contrast between his workplace and my own, an office in the Wall Street area with a prominent view of an ugly building, could hardly have been more striking. I pled guilty to jealousy. In contrast to virtually all the other traders I had interviewed, Sakota's desk is not flanked by an array of quote screens, or, for that matter, even a single screen. His trading is largely confined to the few minutes it takes to run his computer program. Which generates signals for the next day. In my conversation with Sakota, I was struck by the intensity of both his intelligence and sensitivity. An odd combination, I thought. He has a way of looking at things from a unique vantage point. At one moment, he could be talking about analytical techniques and would appear as the consummate scientist. He holds a degree in electrical engineering from MIT. Bringing up a three-dimensional diagram on the computer screen. Generated by one of the many programs he had designed, yet in another moment, when the conversation turned to the psychology of trading, he would reveal great sensitivity and insight into human behavior. Indeed, in recent years, Sakota has become very involved in the field of psychology. It appeared to me that psychology and its application in helping people solve their problems had become a more important element in his life than market analysis and trading. I suspect that Sakota would probably find this contrast somewhat artificial, in that to him, trading and psychology are one and the same thing. Our conversation was not as focused as I had intended it to be. In fact, it went off in so many directions that we had barely scratched the surface by the time the two hours had elapsed.
I continued on, assuming that I would merely catch a later flight. As it turned out, the flight that I had missed was the last direct one from Reno to New York. Sakota later told me that he knew in our first phone conversation that I would end up spending the day. He is extremely perceptive about people. For example, at one point in our conversation, Sakota asked me, How many minutes fast do you set your watch? I found this question particularly striking in that, in our brief time together, he had been able to pick up one of my basic character traits. The question was also particularly timely, given my near-missed flight earlier that morning. Sakota's success goes well beyond his trading. He impressed me as someone who has found meaning in his life and was living exactly the life he wanted to be living. And now, the interview. How did you first get involved in trading? In the late 1960s, I decided that silver had to rise when the U.S. Treasury stopped selling it. I opened a commodity margin account to take full advantage of my insight. While I was waiting, my broker convinced me to short some copper. I soon got stopped out and lost some money and my trading virginity. So I went back to waiting for the start of the big, inevitable bull market in silver. Finally, the day arrived. I bought. Much to my amazement and financial detriment, the price started falling. At first, it seemed impossible to me that silver could fall on such a bullish deal, yet the price was falling, and that was a fact. Soon, my stop got hit. This was a very stunning education about the way markets discount news. I became more and more fascinated with how markets work. About that time, I saw a letter published by Richard Donkian, which implied that a purely mechanical trend-following system could beat the markets. Well, this seemed too impossible to me, so I wrote computer programs on punch cards in those days, to test the theories. Amazingly, his theories tested true. To this day, I'm not sure I understand why or whether I really need to. Anyhow, studying the markets and backing up my opinions with money was so fascinating compared to my other career opportunities at the time that I began trading full-time for a living. What was your first trading-related job? I landed my first job on Wall Street in the early 1970s as an analyst with a major brokerage house. I was assigned to cover the egg and broiler markets. Broilers are young chickens up to two and a half pounds dressed weight. The futures markets for both broilers and eggs have since disappeared as waning trading activity prompted their delisting by the parent exchanges. I found it interesting that an entry-level guy like me was immediately placed in charge of dispensing trading advice. I once wrote an article recommending that traders stay away from the market for a while. Management censored that comment from the market letter, likely because it didn't promise to motivate much trading. I wanted to start applying computers to the business of analysis. Remember, in those days, computers were still typically punch card devices used for accounting. The guy who was running the computer department seemed to see me as a threat to his job security, and he repeatedly chased me off his turf. After about a month at that job, I announced that I was going to quit. The head of the department called me in to find out why. It was the first time he'd ever been interested in talking to me. I went to work for another brokerage house, which was going through a reorganization. There was a lot less management, so I took advantage of the lack of supervision by using the accounting computer to test trading systems during the weekends. They had an IBM 360, which took up a large air-conditioned room. Over the course of about a half year, I was able to test about a hundred variations of four simple systems for about ten years of data on ten commodities. Today, the same job takes about one day on a PC. Anyway, I got my results. They confirmed there was a possibility of making money from trend-following systems. I take it that computer testing of systems was not part of your job since you did it on weekends. What were you actually hired to do? During the week, my normal Clark Kent-type job was to load new rolls of paper into the Reuters machine when the margin turned pink. I was also responsible for tearing off the news in strips and hanging them up on the wall behind the machine. The trick was to tear between line feeds so as to get a smooth edge. The funny thing was that hardly anyone would read the news since they'd have to lean way over the machine to see the pages. So I started reading the news and personally delivering it to the brokers. One bonus of this job was that I got to observe a lot of brokers' trading styles. Your official position sounds like a glorified office boy. Why did you accept such a menial job? Because I knew I wanted to be in the business, and I didn't care what I did or what I got paid. Why didn't you stay at your original position? At least there you were an analyst. Because it was a stultifying environment. 
I disapproved of management pressures to recommend trades when I thought there were no trading opportunities. Also, I saw that being allowed access to the company computers for testing trading systems, my real desire, was a dead issue. Did you know that you could have access to the computer at your new job? No, but since the company had just gone through a major shakeup and most of the management had been fired, I figured there wouldn't be very much of a bureaucracy to interfere with my use of the computer. What became of your work on computerized trading systems? Eventually, management got interested in using my research results for managing money. I developed the first large-scale commercial computerized trading system. What do you mean by large scale? The program was marketed by several hundred agents of the firm, and the equity under management was several million dollars—a large amount of money in the early 1970s. How did you get management to support you to that extent? They were familiar with Richard Donkian, who was a pioneer in developing trend-following trading systems. Although at the time he was doing everything by hand, because of that exposure, they were already favorably disposed to the concept of using trading systems to manage money. Also at that time, computers were so new that computer system was a great buzzword. How did your trading program do? The program did fine. The problem was that management couldn't keep from second guessing the signals. For example, I remember one time the program generated a buy signal for sugar when it was trading around five cents. Management thought that the market was already overbought and decided not to take the signal. When the market kept on going higher, they came up with the rule that they would buy on the first twenty-point pullback. One hundred points equal one cent. When no such pullback developed, they modified the rule to buying on the first thirty-point reaction. As the market kept moving higher without any meaningful retracements, they changed the rule to fifty points and eventually one hundred points. Finally, with sugar prices around nine cents, they finally decided that it was a bull market and that they had better buy before prices went much higher. They put the managed accounts long at that point. As you might guess, the sugar market peaked shortly thereafter. They compounded the error by ignoring the sell signal as well, a signal which also would have been very profitable. The bottom line was that because of this interference, the most profitable trade of the year ended up losing money. As a result, instead of a theoretical return of 60% for the year, quite a few accounts actually lost money. This type of meddling was one of the main reasons why I eventually quit. What were the other reasons? Management wanted me to change the system so that it would trade more actively. Thereby generating more commission income, I explained to them that it would be very easy to make such a change, but doing so would seriously impede performance. They didn't seem to care. What did you do after you quit? I just quit the research department, but I stayed on as a broker managing accounts. After about two years, I gave up brokerage to become a money manager. That shift allowed me to get away from earning my living from commissions, which I think can be a counterproductive incentive to making money for clients. I switched to a pure profit incentive fee arrangement. Did you continue trading the system after you left? Yes, although I substantially revised the system over the years. What is the performance track record? Well, I don't publicize my track record other than my model account, which is an actual customer account that started with five thousand dollars in 1972 and has made over fifteen million dollars. Theoretically, the total return would have been many multiples larger had there been no withdrawals. With performance like that, how come you haven't been deluged with word-of-mouth requests to manage money? I do receive requests, but I rarely accept new accounts. If I do, it's only after considerable interviewing and screening to determine the motivations and attitudes of the client. I have found that the people I associate with have subtle yet very important effects on my performance. If, for example, they are able to support me and my methods over the long term, then they tend to help me. If, however, they get too concerned with the short-term ups and downs of their account, they can be a hindrance. How many accounts did you originally start out with? About a half dozen back in the early 1970s. How many of those accounts are still with you? Four. One client made about 15 million and decided to withdraw his money and manage it himself. Another made over 10 million dollars and decided to buy a house on the beach and retire. What source did you learn from before designing your first system? I was inspired and influenced by the book *Reminiscences of a Stock Operator* and also by Richard Donkian's five and twenty-day moving average crossover system and his weekly rule system. I consider Donkian to be one of the guiding lights of technical trading. What was your first trading system? My first system was a variation of Donkian's moving average system. 
I used an exponential averaging method because it was easier to calculate and computational errors tended to disappear over time. It was so new at the time that it was being passed around by word of mouth as the exponential system. Your reference to a first system implies that you eventually change systems. How did you know when your system needed to be changed? Systems don't need to be changed. The trick is for a trader to develop a system with which he is compatible. Were you incompatible with your original system? My original system was very simple with hard and fast rules that didn't allow for any deviations. I found it difficult to stay with the system while disregarding my own feelings. I kept jumping on and off, often at just the wrong time. I thought I knew better than the system. At the time, I really didn't trust that trend-following systems would work. There's plenty of literature proving they don't. Also, it seemed a waste of my intellect and MIT education to just sit there and not try to figure out the markets. Eventually, as I became more confident of trading with the trend and more able to ignore the news, I became more comfortable with the approach. Also, as I continued to incorporate more expert trader rules, my system became more compatible with my trading style. What is your trading style? My style is basically trend following, with some special pattern recognition and money management algorithms. Without divulging trade secrets, how have you been able to so spectacularly outperform standard trend following systems? The key to long-term survival and prosperity has a lot to do with the money management techniques incorporated into the technical system. There are old traders and there are bold traders, but there are very few old bold traders. Witty and true, but the question remains, albeit in translated form, there are many trend-following systems with money management rules. Why have you done so much better? I seem to have a gift. I think it's related to my overall philosophy, which has a lot to do with loving the markets and maintaining an optimistic attitude. Also, as I keep trading and learning, my system, that is the mechanical computer version of what I do, keeps evolving. I would add that I consider myself and how I do things as a kind of system which, by definition, I always follow. Sometimes I trade entirely off the mechanical part. Sometimes I override the signals based on strong feelings. And sometimes I just quit altogether. The immediate trading result of this jumping around is probably break even to somewhat negative. However, if I didn't allow myself the freedom to discharge my creative side, it might build up to some kind of blowout. Striking a workable ecology seems to promote trading longevity, which is one key to success. How would you compare the relative advantages and disadvantages of systems trading versus discretionary trading? Systems trading is ultimately discretionary. The manager still has to decide how much risk to accept, which markets to play, and how aggressively to increase and decrease the trading base as a function of equity change. These decisions are quite important, often more important than trade timing. What percentage of your trading is systems based? Has this percentage changed over time? Over time, I've become more mechanical since one, I've become more trusting of trend trading, and two, my mechanical programs have factored in more and more tricks of the trade. I still go through periods of thinking I can outperform my own system, but such excursions are often self-correcting through the process of losing money. What are the present and future prospects for trend-following systems? Do you think the growing prevalence of their use will doom them to eventual failure? No, all trading is done on some sort of system, whether or not it is conscious. Many of the good systems are based on following trends. Life itself is based on trends. Birds start south for the winter and keep on going. Companies track trends and alter their products accordingly. Tiny protozoa move in trends along chemical and luminescence gradients. The profitability of trading systems seems to move in cycles. Periods during which trend-following systems are highly successful will lead to their increased popularity. As the number of system users increases and the market shift from trending to directionless price action, these systems become unprofitable and undercapitalized, and inexperienced traders will get shaken out. Longevity is the key to success. What are your thoughts about using fundamental analysis as an input in trading? Fundamentals that you read about are typically useless as the market has already discounted the price, and I call them funny mentals. However, if you catch on early before others believe, then you might have valuable surprise mentals. Your answer is a bit facetious. Does it imply that you only use technical analysis?
I'm primarily a trend trader with touches of hunches based on about 20 years of experience. In order of importance to me are one, the long-term trend, two, the current chart pattern, and three, picking a good spot to buy or sell. Those are the three primary components of my trading. Way down in very distant fourth place are my fundamental ideas, and quite likely on balance, they've cost me money. By picking the right spot to buy, do you mean determining a reaction point at which you will buy? If so, how do you avoid sometimes missing major price moves? Oh no, if, if I were buying, my point would be above the market. I try to identify a point at which I expect the market momentum to be strong in the direction of the trade so as to reduce my probable risk. I don't try to pick a bottom or top. Does that imply that if you are bullish, you will always wait for short-term strength before entering a position, or will you sometimes buy on a reaction? If I'm bullish, I neither buy on a reaction nor wait for strength. I'm already in. I turn bullish at the instant my buy stop is hit, and stay bullish until my sell stop is hit. Being bullish and not being long is illogical. Do you ever use contrary opinion as an aid to your trading? Sometimes. For example, at a recent gold bug conference, virtually all the speakers were bearish. I said to myself, gold is probably near a bottom. The market did indeed rally after that conference. Would you buy because of that type of input? Oh, no, the trend was still down, but it might get me to lighten up my short position. What was your most dramatic or emotional trading experience? Dramatic and emotional trading experiences tend to be negative. Pride is a great banana peel, as are hope, fear, and greed. My biggest slip-ups occurred shortly after I got emotionally involved with positions. How about some actual war stories? I prefer not to dwell on past situations. I tend to cut bad trades as soon as possible, forget them, and then move on to new opportunities. After I bury a dead trade, I don't like to dig up the details again, at least not in print. Maybe some evening after dinner, sitting around a fire off the record, deep in the Tahoe winter. Can you describe specific trading mistakes that you learned from? I had a thing for silver for years. One of my first losses was in silver, as were many of my worst losses. It seemed to get into my blood and hypnotize me. It inveigled me to pull my protective stop so as to avoid getting bear raided. Naturally, it would hold momentarily and then collapse some more. I got killed so many times by silver spikes that I started thinking I was some kind of werewolf. I worked on myself with hypnosis and positive imagery. I also avoided walks in the full moon. So far, it seems to be working. How do you pick your trades? Mostly by my trading system, though occasionally I will get an impulsive flash and override my system. Fortunately, I don't usually take on a big enough position to do any lasting damage to my portfolio. What are the elements of good trading? The elements of good trading are 1. Cutting losses, 2. Cutting losses, and 3. Cutting losses. If you can follow these three rules, you may have a chance. How do you handle a losing streak? I handle losing streaks by trimming down my activity. I just wait it out. Trying to trade during a losing streak is emotionally devastating. Trying to play catch-up is lethal. Since you are primarily a systems trader, wouldn't following a system imply no changes of trading activity during losing periods? I've incorporated some logic into my computer program, such as modulating the trading activity depending on market behavior. Still, important decisions need to be made outside the mechanical system boundaries, such as how to maintain diversification for a growing account when some positions are at position limit or when markets are too thin. Psychologically, I tend to alter my activity depending on performance. I tend to be more aggressive after I've been winning and less so after losses. These tendencies seem okay. In contrast, a costly tendency is to get emotional over a loss and then try to get even with an overly large position. Are you a self-taught trader or did another trader teach you worthwhile lessons? I'm a self-taught trader who is continually studying both myself and other traders. Do you decide where you are getting out before you get in on a trade? I set protective stops at the same time I enter a trade. I normally move these stops in to lock in a profit as the trend continues. Sometimes I take profits when a market gets wild. This usually doesn't get me out any better than waiting for my stops to close in, but it does cut down on the volatility of the portfolio, which helps calm my nerves. Losing a position is aggravating, whereas losing your nerve is devastating. 
What is the maximum percentage of equity you will risk on any individual trade? I intend to risk below 5% on a trade, allowing for poor executions. Occasionally, I've taken losses above that amount when major news caused a thin market to jump through my stops. What was your single worst thin market loss? All markets are too thin when I want to get out of a bad position in a hurry. Most markets have, on occasion, moved rapidly against me due to surprise news. As soon as the news is digested, the market thickens up again at a new level. During the big sugar bull market, when prices moved from ten cents to forty cents, I was carrying thousands of contracts, and I gave up several cents getting out of my position. Each cent in sugar is equivalent to one thousand one hundred twenty dollars per contract. Very few traders have enjoyed the spectacular success you have. What makes you different? I feel my success comes from my love of the markets. I'm not a casual trader. It's my life. I have a passion for trading. It's not merely a hobby or even a career choice for me. There's no question that this is what I am supposed to do with my life. What are the trading rules you live by? A. Cut losses. B. Ride winners. C. Keep bets small. D. Follow the rules without question. E. Know when to break the rules. Your last two rules are cute because they are contradictory. Seriously, now, which do you believe? Follow the rules or know when to break the rules? Well, I believe both. Mostly, I follow the rules. As I keep studying the markets, I sometimes find a new rule which breaks and then replaces a previous rule. Sometimes I get to a personal break point. When that happens, I just get out of the markets altogether and take a vacation until I feel that I'm ready to follow the rules again. Perhaps some day I will have a more explicit rule for breaking rules. I don't think traders can follow rules for very long unless they reflect their own trading style. Eventually, a breaking point is reached, and the trader has to quit or change or find a new set of rules he can follow. This seems to be part of the process of evolution and growth of a trader. How important to trading success is varying the size of the bet. It might be a good idea, depending on the reason for doing so. Consider though that if you had a successful modification policy, say M for changing system S, then you might be better off just trading M. How important is gut feel? Gut feel is important. If ignored, it may come out in subtle ways by coloring your logic. It can be dealt with through meditation and reflection to determine what's behind it. If it persists, then it might be a valuable subconscious analysis of some subtle information. Otherwise, it might be a dangerous sublimation of an inner desire for excitement and not reflect market conditions. Be sensitive to the subtle differences between intuition and into wishing. What was your worst year? What went wrong? One of my worst years was 1980. The bull markets had ended, but I kept trying to hold on and buy back in at lower prices. The markets just kept on breaking. I had never seen a major bear market before, so I was all set up for an important educational experience. What happened to the money management rules in your system in 1980? Did you override them? I continued to trade, even though my system was largely out of the markets due to the enormous volatility. I tried to pick tops and bottoms in what I considered grossly overbought and oversold markets. The markets just kept on going, and I lost a lot. Eventually, I saw the futility of my approach and quit for a while. What is the most important advice you can give the average trader? That he should find a superior trader to do his trading for him, and then go find something he really loves to do. Do you believe chart reading can be used for successful trading? I consider trend following to be a subset of charting. Charting is a little like surfing. You don't have to know a lot about the physics of tides, resonance, and fluid dynamics in order to catch a good wave. You just have to be able to sense when it's happening and then have the drive to act at the right time. What was your personal experience in October 1987? I made money on the day of the October 1987 crash. I also made money for the month as a whole and for the year as well. I lost on the day after the crash, however, since I was short the interest rate markets. Most trend traders were likely either out or short stocks and stock indexes during the crash. Are the markets different now than they were five to ten years ago because of the much greater current participation by professional managers? No, the markets are the same now as they were five to ten years ago because they keep changing just like they did then. Does trading become more difficult as your size increases? It becomes more difficult because it's harder to move large positions without moving the market. 
it becomes easier because you have more access to competent people to support you. What type of support do you mean? A team of experienced brokers with professional attitudes. Experienced traders can be very supportive by just being there for sharing joys and sorrows. Also, the old timers seem to be able to smell the beginnings and endings of major moves. I also receive important support from my friends, associates, and family. Do you use any outside advisory services? I keep track of a lot of outside advisors, mostly by reading the business press or hearing from my brokers. The services usually break even, except when they start to gloat. Then they are likely headed for trouble. What about market letters? Market letters tend to lag behind the market since they generally respond to demand for news about recent activity. Although there are certainly important exceptions, letter writing is often a beginning job in the industry, and as such may be handled by inexperienced traders or non-traders. Good traders trade. Good letter writers write letters. Do you use the opinions of other traders in making trading decisions, or do you operate completely solo? I usually ignore advice from other traders, especially the ones who believe they are onto a sure thing. The old timers who talk about maybe there is a chance of so and so are often right and early. At what point did you get the confidence that you could keep on winning as a trader? I vacillate between A, I can keep on winning, and B, I have just been lucky. I sometimes get most confident of my ability just before a major losing streak. How similar are the price patterns in different markets? Common patterns transcend individual market behavior. For example, bond prices have a lot in common with the way cockroaches crawl up and down a wall. Unfortunately for cockroach followers, there is usually no one around to take the other side of a trade. Does the stock market behave differently from other markets? The stock market behaves differently from all other markets, and it also behaves differently from the stock market. If this is hard to understand, it's because trying to understand the markets is a bit futile. I don't think it makes any more sense trying to understand the stock market than trying to understand music. A lot of people would rather understand the market than make money. What do you mean the stock market behaves differently from the stock market? The stock market behaves differently from itself in that easily identifiable patterns seldom exactly repeat. What is your long-term outlook for inflation, the dollar, and gold? Inflation is part of the way societies sweep away the old order. All currencies eventually get debased, like it or not. Compute one penny invested at the time of Christ, compounded at three percent per year. Then consider why nobody has anywhere near that amount these days. Gold tends to be dug up, refined, and then buried again. The geographical entropy of all gold on the planet seems to decrease over time. A lot has been collected in vaults. I project the trend as one toward a central world of gold stash. Do great traders have a special talent for trading? Good traders have a special talent for trading, just as good musicians and good athletes have talents for their fields. Great traders are one who are absorbed by the talent. They don't have the talent. The talent has them. What is the balance between talent versus work in trading success? I don't know where one starts and the other stops. How much of a role does luck play in trading success? Luck plays an enormous role in trading success. Some people were lucky enough to be born smart, while others were even smarter and got born lucky. How about a serious answer? Luck or smarts or gift are words indicating an attitudinal proclivity for mastery. One tends to do well at one's calling. I think most traders have a little extra spark about trading. Some people are natural musicians or painters or salesmen or analysts. I think it's difficult to acquire talent for trading. However, if it's already there, it can be discovered and developed. What effect has trading had on your personal life? My personal life is integrated with my trading life. Is the joy of winning as intense as the pain of losing? The joy of winning and the pain of losing are right up there with the pain of winning and the joy of losing. Also to consider are the joy and pain of not participating. The relative strengths of these feelings tend to increase with the distance of the trader from his commitment to being a trader. When you made your first million, did you lock some of it away to avoid the Jesse Livermore experience? Uh, Livermore was a famous speculator of the early 20th century who made and lost several fortunes. 
I feel the Livermore experience was a function of his psychology and had little to do with the location of his assets. In fact, I remember reading that Jesse Livermore used to lock some of his winnings away and then find a key when he needed to get at them. Therefore, locking up winnings would be necessary to emulate his experience, not to avoid it. Furthermore, you would probably also need to overtrade and have wipeouts while you simultaneously fired up your emotions with the burning desire to win it right back. Acting out this drama could be exciting. However, it also seems terribly expensive. One alternative is to keep bets small and then to systematically keep reducing risk during equity drawdowns. That way, you approach your safe money asymptomatically and have a gentle financial and emotional touchdown. I notice there is no quote machine on your desk. Having a quote machine is like having a slot machine on your desk. You end up feeding it all day long. I get my price data after the close each day. Why do so many traders fail in the marketplace? For the same reason that most baby turtles fail to reach maturity. Many are called and few are chosen. Society works by the attraction of the many. As they are called out, the good ones are left, and the others are released to go try something else until they find their calling. The same is true for other fields of pursuit. What can a losing trader do to transform himself into a winning trader? A losing trader can do little to transform himself into a winning trader. A losing trader is not going to want to transform himself. That's the kind of thing winning traders do. How would you rate the relative importance between psychology and market analysis to successful trading? Psychology motivates the quality of analysis and puts it to use. Psychology is the driver, and analysis is the roadmap. You focus a lot on the field of psychology. Can you tell by talking to a person whether that person would probably be a winning or losing trader? Yes, the winning traders have usually been winning at whatever field they are in for years. What traits do you look for to identify the winning trader personality? One, he or she loves to trade, and two, he or she loves to win. Don't all traders want to win? Win or lose, everybody gets what they want out of the market. Some people seem to like to lose, so they win by losing money. I know one trader who seems to get in near the start of every substantial bull move and works his ten thousand dollars up to about a quarter of a million in a couple of months. Then. He changes his personality and loses it all back again. This process repeats like clockwork. Once I traded with him, but got out when his personality changed. I doubled my money while he wiped out as usual. I told him what I was doing and even paid him a management fee. He just couldn't help himself. I don't think he can do it any differently. He wouldn't want to. He gets a lot of excitement. He gets to be a martyr. He gets sympathy from his friends, and he gets to be the center of attention. Also, possibly, he may be more comfortable relating to people if he is on their financial plane. On some level, I think he's really getting what he wants. I think that if people look deeply enough into their trading patterns, they find that on balance, including all their goals, they are really getting what they want, even though they may not understand it or want to admit it. A doctor friend of mine tells a story about a cancer patient who used her condition to demand attention. And in general, to dominate others around her, as an experiment prearranged with her family, the doctor told her a shot was available which would cure her. She constantly found excuses to avoid appearing for the shot, and eventually avoided it entirely. Perhaps her political position was more important than her life. People's trading performance probably reflects their priorities more than they would like to admit. I think that some of the most flamboyant and interesting traders are playing for more than profits alone. They're probably also playing for excitement. One of the best ways to increase profits is to do goal setting and visualizations in order to align the conscious and subconscious with making profits. I've worked with a number of traders in order to examine their priorities and align their goals. I use a combination of hypnosis, breathing, pacing, visualization, gestalt. Massage and so forth. The traders usually either one get much more successful, or two realize they didn't really want to be traders in the first place. Surely some people lose because they lack the skill, even though they really want to win. It's a happy coincidence that when nature gives us true burning desires, she also gives us the means to satisfy them. Those who want to win and lack skill can get someone with skill to help them.
I sometimes have dreams related to the impending direction of a market, although these dreams tend to be very infrequent. Uncannily, they often prove right. Have you had any similar experiences? I know several people who claim to have market insights during dreams. I think one of the functions of dreams is to reconcile information and feelings which the conscious mind finds intractable. For instance, I once told a lot of my friends that I expected silver to keep going up. When it went down instead, I ignored the signs and tried to tell myself it was just a temporary correction. I stood to lose face and money. I couldn't afford to be wrong. Around that time, I had dreams of being in a big, shiny silver aircraft that stalled out. And started going down toward an inevitable crash. I eventually dumped my silver position, even went short, and the dream stopped. How do you judge success? Oh, I don't judge success. I celebrate it. I think success has to do with finding and following one's calling, regardless of financial gain. A few closing thoughts. Don't be fooled by the humor in Sakota's comments. There is a great deal of serious wisdom in his pithy replies. For me personally, the most striking comment was, "Everybody gets what they want out of the market." When Sakota first made this remark, I thought he was merely being cute, but I soon realized he was deadly serious. My reflexive response to this premise was disbelief. It implies that all losers want to lose, and all winners who fall short of their goals, like myself. Are fulfilling some inner need for a constrained threshold of success—a difficult proposition to swallow. Although my rigidly logical mind would normally dismiss this idea, my respect for Sakota's knowledge about the markets and people forces me to consider the potential truth of the statement that everybody gets what they want out of the market—a most provocative concept.